This morning we'll conclude God Never Said That series. We've talked about how God never said he wants just for you to be happy. Last week we, we talked about how uh, it, it, it turned out that we, we hunker down on the subject of sin and how God, it, you know, hey, it, that uh, there are folks today that are afraid to, to call people out and, and the preacher's afraid to say that and call folks sinners. And, and, uh, and so it, it, it was very, very powerful in my opinion. A lot of people asked for the outlines, so we're going to try to start posting those. This week we're going to finish on this. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you believe. God never said that. It doesn't matter what you believe. Now, hold your place in the Bible. I'll be there in just a moment. Remember last week I talked about one of the big issues of our time is, is tolerance. And how I've watched just in my 18 plus years of pastoring that word really evolve to mean more than just how everybody is equal. Tolerance used to mean that each individual person was equal. And I believe in that, that we're equal. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter where you, what you have or do not have. That I believe the Bible teaches that we are one. Hence why we call this church one. We're all one in Christ. Paul would write the church at Galatia to say there's male or female, bond or free. There's no barbaric Greek. It's, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so, but now what has happened is, is that it's evolved where tolerance means that every individual person's idea is equal. And I totally disagree with that. Because I don't know about you, but I've met, some, I've met some ignorant people in my life. And I don't know that they have it all figured out just like they think they do. All right? Now, I, that may sound crude and rude to you. I'm just being real with you. All right? But tolerance has evolved to say that everybody's idea is now equal. Now, what that leads to is this. You still with me? What that leads to is, is, is this, this mentality that's out there that you've heard it before, that all roads lead to heaven. All roads. As a matter of fact, th there may be some of you that have heard or even said or at one time believe it this way, that it doesn't matter really what you believe as long as you are sincere about it. And I want you to know that this may sound crazy, and those watching by video and listening to the podcast, I want you to know this may sound crazy when I say this. I do believe out of every world religion, there's a bit of good in every one of them. Would you agree with that? I, believe, I don't think that it's wrong for you to be moral. I don't think it's wrong for you to do good and live by the golden rule, even if it is something that's based off Christianity. But you say, I'm saying there's a little good in everyone, but that does not make them the way. That does not make them correct when it deals with eternity. And so very quickly, I'm going to get to that verse of Scripture, and you're going to see why it makes sense in just a moment, and we're going to do the rest of our time. We're going to dissect what makes Christianity unique, all right? Because God never said it don't matter what you believe. As a matter of fact, it is the most important decision you will ever make in your entire life, and as far as eternity is concerned, is how you believe. And what and whom, really, you believe in. Let me give you just a few of the, and I'm not going to do any kind of dissecting uh, uh, in real specifics, but let's just look at some of the major world religions. Buddhism. Buddhism uh, believes that you reach a state of nirvana, you transcending state of bliss. A person must follow a noble eightfold path, a process of, uh, you know, like the Ninja Turtles, a process of personal effort and discipline will end suffering. Uh, uh, this, this, this thing of, uh, of, of, uh, doing good. So see, there's a little bit of good in everything. Some people believe they worship Buddha. That's not really true. But they, they believe in this, this, this believing to reach nirvana and just doing good. Uh, Hinduism believe that they'll reach mokesha, a freedom uh, from the world. They believe in the cycle of death and reincarnation. It, it's like, uh, uh, if I heard someone say this. I think it was Craig Rochelle because he was preaching on this very same subject uh, as he inspired this, this series for me. And he said that he knew a guy, uh, I think it was a gal, that said, uh, I must in my past life, I must have been from France, and, and, I, and I, I must have been a tree, because I love France, and I love trees. And he said, well, in my past life, I, I must have been from France, and I was a dog. It peed on the tree. Anyway, it, 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 it's, but they believe, it, it, they keep coming back. Wouldn't that be sad? I mean, because as good as your life is and as blessed as I think I am, this life's pretty tough. Full of pain and disappointment. But yet, they believe in reincarnation and self-realization. Muslims, of course, and we, man, that's so prevalent in, 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 uh, in our society. They believe in Allah. Uh, Muhammad was their prophet. They believe in, in of course, uh, paradise, who, uh, who live moral and upright lives, that you'll inherit paradise using the five pillars of basic 
All right. New Age, just very quickly, New, New Age, man, New Age folks, they, they believe that they are God. They believe that through Gnosticism or knowledge that they, they can achieve a higher enlightenment and, and their goal is to be God. Do, do you understand that? All right, so this is new age. You, you don't need anybody, you know, these things. All of these, all of these have a bit of good in them. They, they got some morality to them. But when we line them up, now stay with me, when we line them up against Christianity, what makes Christianity so unique and stand out as so different? And I'm going to break down a few things this morning. Let, let me read something to you, though. As a famous atheist turned Christian, and most of you may not even have known, known this, but C.S. Lewis once stated, Christianity, you listen to me say amen. amen. Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. Now listen to what he says as he finishes the statement. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. So I suggest to you this morning that Christianity has to be of utmost importance to you. And let me say before we go any further to you, you're still with me, right? Let me say, and those listening and those watching, I am biased. I, I am a Christian. And so if you hear this and it seems biased and you think I'm being biased, I'm biased. I also am not asking you to join this church or become a Christian. I'm asking you simply, simply to think about it. That's all I'm asking you to do. Open yourself up this morning to what God would have and what God is saying. Here, here's what makes Christianity so unique. John 14, verse 6 you there? Say amen. amen. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That separates, that one statement separates Christianity from all of the world religions that we see today and have ever been. And what makes it so unique, and if you take notes, you'll want to get these. If not, you'll, you'll look at it later. Christianity, here we go. Christianity is not a system of works. Christianity is not a system of works. All those other religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Muslim, the New Age, all of them believe that you've got to do these things. When we talk about Christianity, it's not a system of works. It, 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 listen, Romans 3, 10, and 12 says this. Paul writes in the church at Rome. He says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. King James says, none righteous. No, not one. The, the, here's what you It's just like last week. Here's what I'm saying to you. You are not a good person. The moment you begin to believe that you're a good person is the moment you believe you don't need God. The moment you start believing that you're a good person or your child is a good person, because I know they're cute and cuddly. I get it. I'm telling you right now, they're born sinners, just like you are a born sinner. And, and here is what this is saying when it comes to this level in Christianity being unique, is that you can't work your way in. You can't do good enough to merit heaven. Paul wrote the church of Ephesians in chapter 2, of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2. He said, it is not of works, at least anybody should boast. It is the gift of God through Christ Jesus. So what makes Christianity unique and why God never said it don't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere and as long as you do good is that Christianity is not a system of works. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. I don't get up every morning and say, man, I'm ready to serve the Lord. I rolled over this morning. My alarm goes off real early on Sunday mornings. I have a routine that I'm just, I mean, I am. Don't mess that routine up. It's crazy how strict I am about listening, about reading, about retyping, about all the things that I like to go through. But I'm telling you, the first thing I thought this morning when the alarm, when the phone went off, it was, mm, I'm going to get 30 more minutes here. Let me, let me adjust this. That was not God-centered. That was self-centered. I am trying to get you to understand the uniqueness of Christianity is it's just not based off a system of works. Point number two is this. Christianity is not a religious system. You say, well, I said what you, no, no but a relationship with God. Christianity is unique because it's not a religious system. It, it is a relationship with God. Other religions are systems of do's and don'ts to appease God, whereas Christianity is a relationship with God. Ephesians 1.5 is a cross-reference here. Listen to what Paul said. God decided in advance. 
The Sunday morning I give my life to Jesus Christ, the United Assembly of God, I told you I was only there because of the girl I was dating, because her mom and dad said, you going to date my daughter, you got to go to church. And I was like, hmm. Well, as soon as church is over, we're going to town. I'll put up with this junk. This verse absolutely reinstates the very truth that I'm a, a physical, visible product of that God decided in advance Long before you were thinking that you might love God, God said, I love you even before the foundation of the world. In advance, in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and he gave him great pleasure. Christianity is not a religious system, but a relationship with God. God doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because of who he is. God does not love you because of what you do or don't do. He loves you because of who he is. God is love. Now, don't reverse that. Love is not God. God is love. And what makes Christianity, the belief in Jesus Christ, what makes it unique and so different than all other world religions is that it's not a system of religious rules. It is a relationship with Jesus. How many of you last week need reminded, you admitted, it's on video, you've told a lie, which makes you a, you have stole, you've taken something that belonged to you, which makes you, don't say stealer, you have looked at someone beside your spouse in lust, which makes you, according to Jesus, an adulterer. So you've already established and admitted that you're a lying, thieving, adulterer. So you understand that even if you did your best to keep all ten commandments, you would fall short of the glory of God every time. For there's none righteous, no, not one. It is a gift of God. And isn't it an awesome thing to know that on the days or during the day, you have moments that you don't feel like you love God, that you don't act like you love God, that you don't talk like you love God. Isn't it awesome to know that he never unplugs and stops loving us? Isn't that good? I told Sandra last night when, I, when we got the girls to bed, about three peas in a pod in that bed. And Lenny, you'll relate to this. I told Sandra, I said, Lord have mercy. Why do I feel guilty for getting on to them? I get on to them because I love them. God sends his conviction because he loves us. But not one time when I'm yelling at her or them or whatever I'm doing, not one time do I ever stop loving them. Now in that moment, <laughs> you see, I told you it would be so much better once you graduated out here with us. You get to hear and be a part of the illustrations instead of just catching them second hand. I guarantee she didn't feel like it in the midst of it or there wouldn't have been those crocodile tears. Do you understand what I'm preaching this morning? Christianity is unique. We're not just another world religion. We are not just another path or a road that leads to paradise. It is a narrow way, Jesus said. Few that will find it and make their way on it. I'm telling you, what makes us so unique that stands out is that Christianity is not a system of works. It is not a religious system, but it is a relationship with God. Isn't it an awesome thing to know that God said, I love you, but long before you ever even realized you loved him. And the more I learn about his love for me, the deeper I fall in love with him. The more I realize he puts up with through the reflection of the folks around me and what I see and the stuff that comes out, the more I realize just how deep his love is for me. God doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because of who he is. Thirdly, Christianity is unique because Christianity's source of information. These are all highlights. This is all introduction, by the way, so just hang on, all right? Hope you pack a snack. Christianity's source of information. Christianity looks to the Bible as a, watch this, make sure you get this word. You still with me? Say amen. As a singular source of information. We believe here at One Community Church, pastoral staff, trustees, and everybody that I know of believes that the Word of God is the, watch this, absolute truth. 
If it was good then, it is good now. If he said it then, he said it now. We do not believe in new revelations either. Be very careful of a man of God or woman of God that said, God has given me a new revelation because when he shut the book, the 66th book, that one we call Revelation that John was given on the Isle of Patmos. Hey, watch this. He finished that part of Revelation. Now, you can be a forth teller. You can be a proclaimer. You can be a prophet of God, which means to speak the truth of God. You can speak into people's lives. But I'm telling you, God has already declared absolute truth. There is no addition to it or subtraction from it. You only rightly divide, Paul told Timothy. I'm preaching better than you, amen. I trained her up. She's my ameniter. She's my wife. She's supposed to amen me. Sometimes in the wrong place, though. Got me last week. Christianity, source of information, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures inspired by God and is useful for to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Sometimes we overlook that, man. We don't want to read it because it points out what's wrong in our lives. So we want it when we need it to bless us. Give me something about how he's going to give me some more money. Give me how he's going to cure this cancer. How about what he points out the bad in our lives? How about the conviction that it brings? And so he says it's, it's good to point out what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. I don't have to have four or five books like the Mormon. I got one book. There's 66. Our next series, we're going to talk more in depth about it. There's 66 books. And some of you say, well, I know that. But I just want to have a little remedial. How many Old Testament books, class? Students ought to know this. How many Old Testament books, class? You smart Bible scholars, you're 39. How many New Testament? 20, not seven. 27. Because three times nine is... I look at students, boy, like, I got that, baby. Yeah, he teaches us. Yeah. 66 canonized books of the Bible. Canonized means that they're authority. They're inerrant, they're infallible, and they're inspired by God. What makes Christianity unique is that we have a living book. How many times have you gone to the Word of God and absolutely every single word you read, whether it's your own reading plan or somebody else's post, it absolutely speaks right to your life. How many times have you gone to a church service where it's been good Bible preaching and you walk away from that Bible preaching and go, he was talking about, did somebody email him? Did my wife call him and tell him? And don't you think I hadn't had people tell me that or ask me that at the back door? Not at this church. I have had you say, it's like you were preaching right to me. That is because it is the living word of God. That is because it is the only thing good I have to say. I will try my best to put it into to my millhillion countryology and application. But the only thing I really know to do is to declare what makes us unique is we have an authorized, powerful, absolute truth that nothing wavers from it. Christianity source of information. And last, and really the beginning of the sermon, the most, you listen to me? The most defining principle of Christianity that makes it unique is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christianity is based upon truly the most amazing event in all of human history. There is no other event that has split time. It is still the best-selling book that, you know, that book we're just talking about, that book that is really a hymn book because it is all about him to just be cheesy and to quote some old-time preacher that I, I like. It is the single greatest event in history, and it is the defining mark and moment for Christianity. It separates us from all other world religions. It makes the statement that Jesus would say in its exclusive statement, and it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man or woman come to the Father but by me. You listening to me? Because I'm, 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 I'm going to preach, okay? Christianity's defining principle is the resurrection. The resurrection, here's the outline, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the core of who we are. 
If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. It is not his death on the cross. It is is his coming back to life with the supernatural power on the third day. The same Holy Spirit, the same holy supernatural power that on the third day entered that tomb, caused Jesus to come up bodily form. He folded his clothes, laid, laid them over, just like he was saying, I'm not done, as Jewish tradition would be. That same Holy Spirit power is the power that will resurrect your life right now. and It is the core of who you are. If you are anyone in Jesus Christ, If you claim to be a Christian, there was a moment that you realized you was a sinner and there was nothing that you could do to save yourself except by faith believe Jesus Christ died and he rose again. It is the core of who we are. If there is no shedding of the blood, there is no remission of the sin. If there is no resurrection, there is no Holy Spirit. And he said, I will send one that will be your comfort. I will send the dunamis, the dynamite, the power, the counselor, and the convictor that will lead you and guide you and teach you in all ways. You can read it, but you won't understand it. But you get the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection, he will absolutely begin to transform your life. It is the core of who we are, kids. It's the core of who we are. Not only is the resurrection the core of who we are, it's what makes us unique. We believe that, yes, there's been a many good men die. There's been a many good men and women die so I can stand here and spit and snort and sweat and shout at you this morning and are standing in harm's way right now. But none of them, none of them, none of them have come back to life on the third day and on the 50th day send the Holy Spirit because on the 40th day they ascended to the right hand of the Father to make intercessions on my behalf and on your behalf. None of them have been resurrected. The resurrection is at the core of who we are. It's what makes us different. It is at the core of who we are. And the resurrection, listen to me, is the certain proof. You listen to say amen. Hallelujah. I'll wear your ameners out, baby. I don't know what church you've been used to, but we're going to amen her around here, okay? All right? And I can roll my own. I preach where they look at me like that. I learned to roll my own early on and train up my ameners, as you got it already. The resurrection is at the core of who we are. The resurrection is certain, clear. Couldn't make mind up which one of those C words I wanted to use, so I'm going to use both of them. A certain clear proof that Jesus was who he said he was and he will do what he said he would do. Now I want you to listen to me very closely. It's best that I could study. The Buddha did not rise from the dead. The best that I could study, Muhammad, who is the prophet and, and the Muslim, Muhammad did not rise from the dead. Confucius did not rise from the dead. Krishna did not rise from the dead. Jesus Christ and Jesus alone is the only one that would bring himself back by the power of the Holy Spirit and would come back to life from the dead, physically and spiritually. So when it is clear, certain proof, only Jesus physically was risen from the dead, walked on water, claimed to be God, and raised others from the dead, he conquered death. He's the only one. The rest of them, you can make your pilgrimage and go pay your respect to the places that they've set up to view their bodies or where they think they're buried. It is clear. It matters what you believe. And you think, well, you don't have to teach that in the Bible Belt. Man, it is greater now in the Bible Belt than it's ever been. There's people out there that believe in all kind of garbage, and it's being preached in the pulpit. I heard a guy preach at camp meeting. I love that they live stream the camp meeting, Church of God camp meeting. I'm not saying we Church of God, we Baptist. I've already put that out there. That's how we roll, baby, all right? I love it. He said this. He said the altars are polluted. We got preachers that think they, they're doing us a favor by rolling in here in their nice suits and their nice clothes, and they give you three points and a poem, and they pat you on the back and send you on the way in about 25 to 30 minutes. Now, I don't know if I could bail my hay tighter. I probably could bail my hay tighter, but I don't want to pollute the altar. I don't care what denomination you are from or what denomination you think we are. I want you to understand what we believe is Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the remission of sin through the shedding of the blood, the power of the Holy Spirit, and that he will absolutely, absolutely resurrect your life. 
It matters what you believe. God never said it didn't matter what you believe. You can't do this thing called Christianity like a buffet at Ryan's. No, it Ryan's ain't no more. Is there any Ryan's? No, no Ryan's. What is that? Where did they take us? Golden Corral. Your favorite eating joint, Nanny. You can't do it like that. You can't go down and look at this and look at that and say, oh, I want some of that and I want some of that and I want some of that. You, you can't do it. You don't have that option. The 66 books are absolute authority. You can't change that. You can run from it. You can try to avoid it. You can water it down. But you will never, ever change the truth. It's absolute. And the resurrection is proof that he is who he said he is and that he's doing what he said he would do. And, and, and let me give you this last one. The resurrection, which what is the most defining principle that makes us unique, the resurrection is what changed the lives of the disciples. Listen to this cross-reference. I'll put the outline up later, so just hang on, okay? Acts 2.32 Peter says, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we were all witnesses of this. You cannot deny that Jesus died and that he come back to life on the third day. Not only can you not deny the power of that, but there were eyewitnesses of it. They said, we witnessed this. And some people say, well, the Romans, they, they, they took the body I mean, don't you, think, don't you think they would love to, to shut the crowd up so they said, no, we really got the body? I mean, let's just use real, million, real common, simplistic thinking. Or do you really think, they said, well, the disciples stole the body. Do you really think that these fishermen, they really run the other direction, but do you think they come back, devise, and I'm not saying fishermen are simpletons, okay? But do you think they devised the most, I'm talking the most, the most elaborate, elaborate escape plan? Do you think that they would have the ability to overcome two trained Roman centurions? Then move that big stone back. Do you think, and hey, listen, watch this. Do you think that handful, are you listening to me? Do you think that handful of people in a small town, anybody know what it's like living in a small town? Your business is somebody else's business, I'm telling you. And be careful what you say because somebody's cousin is who you're talking to, all right? Do you think that they could pull all that off and keep that hid in a small town for all these years? I'll go one better than that. You're still with me, right? If it's not so, why in the world would a disciple say, we witnessed this? Why would we say that it changed their life? In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man or woman come to the Father but by. Who is he talking to? Do you know that, Bible scholar? You say he's talking to us. I know that. But in dialogue, in context, who said, where you go, we don't know, and we don't know the way? Who said that? Doubting. I, I thought I'd help you out a little bit. I know you were like, I knew that. Preacher, I knew that. Doubting Thomas. Thomas be the only one that is actually recorded that he doubted like that. I'm so glad because I'm right there. Jesus said, hey, you don't believe it's me? Check these holes out. As a matter of fact, put your hand in my side. You listening to me? History records, Fox Book of Martyrs. History records that the guy that doubted the resurrection of Jesus Christ would become one of the greatest evangelists to what we now know as India. Watch this. And when they asked him, when they were forcing him to renounce his faith, he said, there's no way I'll deny Jesus Christ. And so Fox Book of Martyrs captures historically that Thomas was speared to death. Why in the world would a man give his life for something that was not true? I'll take you even a step further as we approach altar call. I've watched God in this same resurrecting power, how I know it's true and how I know it's important what you believe. I've watched God. I have watched God over the last 18 plus years. I've seen couples. 
I met this couple. They said, hey, call me. He said, preacher, will you go down to, to so-and-so's house? He's living there. She's kicked him out. He, he's, he, he, he had had an affair. I go down. I, 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 I talk to him. I pray with him. He accepts Jesus Christ. He comes to church. Next thing you know, he's getting baptized. Next thing you know, here's his wife that he's uh, separated from. She's coming. Next thing you know, they've reconciled. She's being baptized. And years have gone by. Now they got this beautiful family. Just bought a beautiful brand new house. You say, why'd you tell us that? That's resurrection power. That's proof that there's a Jesus that's still alive and still resurrecting dead marriages. I just buried a man or a shell that spent most of his time in prison that most people would have passed on by because he was a bad dude. I watched God resurrect his life. I watched God take him from the brink of death. And if you'll watch the video, he's seen heaven and come back because he wasn't done with him yet. I watched God resurrect this man. That's what's unique about Christianity. Right here this morning. Oh, let's, let's back up a few months. Sure, we could back up a few years. Kelly's are here this morning. I asked them, is it okay? And, 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 and they said yes. They were invited to church to come to church. Little did we know behind the scenes they're in the, they're in the greatest turmoil of their life. Man, they're struggling with each other. You ever do that, husband and wife? You ever, you ever struggle? Uh, don't be scared because she's sitting beside you. <laughs> Struggling, I mean mightily. I'm invited to church here, and, and look, this was cool because I didn't even know that this morning. They, they come in here and sitting over here, they're not with us this morning, but the, but the Crumleys are here. And the Crumleys, I performed their wedding ceremony, and you know their story I've shared with you. This is the resurrection power. They're not here this morning, you just sit right over here, about where Nanny is, about in that area. There's a bunch of, here. I performed their wedding ceremony. They told you about me. I did their wedding ceremony. So the, the day they come to church here for the first time, they had no idea I was the pastor here, had no idea the Crumleys go to church here. They walk in. You know, I don't know what was going on with them. I'm telling you, God was kicking their butt right away. Or if you want to be super spiritual, he was the power of the Holy Spirit was on them. Because how about that? How about God would love us so much that he would orchestrate that God in all these years, years ago, I didn't even remember them. They out there at the, at the front porch are going, you don't remember us? And I'm like, nope. I, I married and buried a lot of folk in the other 20 years. And to think, and to think God would orchestrate it in such a way they would walk into this building, in this high school auditorium, and that God would resurrect their marriage. That God, you listening to me? That God would take a high school dropout, a drug addict, a drunkard, a whoremonger, and he would save him. He would call him to the ministry. He'd help him get his GED. He'd send him to seminary. He'd give him a beautiful family, only for a, only for a few years later that family to crumble. And he'd think it's all over. There's no hope. I can never survive. And this little group said, we're going to do something more. Don't you tell me, don't you tell me that the resurrection isn't true. Don't you tell me that the same power that brought Jesus from the tomb is not the same power that will resurrect your dead life right now this morning. Don't you tell me that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ won't change your life right now in this moment if all you will do is but accept it by faith. It matters what you believe. It matters. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you that I think it's important that you believe the right thing that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man or woman come to the Father but by me. And he is still resurrecting people.